Happy Sabbath. Good afternoon. Welcome to our visitors. Welcome to all. I want to thank uh, <coughs> Brother Pascal for that wonderful song. Where did he disappear to? He disappeared so quickly. You know, when you, <coughs> when you hear someone take, especially a young person, take a collection of hymns and bring them together and give a message, hold fast till I come. And you see that the Lord is trying his very best to let us see the things that are happening. But at the same time, he's saying to us, hold fast till I come, because his coming is not way out there. His coming is right here. We are told that his coming, he is nigh at the door. And so as we pick up from where we left off the last time on the seven trumpets, and we talked about the seven trumpets as signs of warning, that a judgment is to come, a judgment is to come, and God used the seven trumpets to allow the people of God to know that he is not joking about judgment. He used the seven trumpets, the hordes of the barbarians and also the Arabs, to let people know, to let mankind know that if God says there's going to be a judgment, there's going to be a judgment. Amen? Amen. And so as we look at the idea of the seven trumpets and contemplate the judgment, let us have a word of prayer that we all will be ready and that we can hold fast till he comes. Father in heaven, nothing in my hands do I hold. And I ask that you would speak through me that your people will hear and that the words that are said are not my own and they are also spoken not just through me, but to me. And that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. As we talked last time, we spoke of Daniel. So if you will, let's turn over quickly to Daniel 7 and 25. If we, you look at Daniel, we're going to do a very short and quick review. We look at Daniel, and when Daniel saw the four beasts of Daniel 11, he saw this fourth beast. Now, he saw these beasts, but when he saw the fourth beast, and he saw all the things about the fourth beast, then Daniel became concerned. Daniel 7, 25 says, and he spake, and he shall speak, excuse me, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand unto a time, times, and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. If we understand that we are in the judgment hour, and exactly where we are in that judgment hour, and who are the characters in the judgment, we will be able to more amply prepare for what is coming, and make the character changes that are desperately needed for now. For instance, two years or rather, Two years, or rather, the time are mentioned in the series of scriptures. When we see, when we go back and it says times and times, that's talking about year, time, and then times means twice the time. Amen? Those so times, times, and the dividing of time. What time is he talking about right there? We need to know these things. What time is he talking about there when he says time, time, and the dividing of times? He's talking about the 1260 years. And that time comes to its end in 1798. And then he goes in verse 26 and says, but the judgment shall sit. And what time is that? 1844. So we see right here that there is a judgment that is to be executed prior to, and then the judgment that's going to be applicable also after, which is 1844. And when we understand that these two times that are being spoken of, in Daniel 7, 25 through 27, if we as God's people 
truly understand these things, then we can understand that the judgment of those before 1798 are just a signal of, to us of what's going to happen once 1844 kicks in. T to prove to mankind that there is going to be a judgment. First, God shows a judgment in the Roman Empire to prove that there's going to be a judgment of humankind. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, so now let's look at Luke 21. As Jesus, as Jesus talks to us about what we can expect, because if we don't understand, if we can't give a reason for what we believe and be able to prove, it's great to say what you believe, isn't it? But can you prove what you believe? That's what is important because when they put, place us in front of magistrates and judges and senators and congressmen and say, why, do you, why won't you keep Sunday and why are you keeping the Sabbath? If you can't give a reason, you just, you're going to be just as bad as those who don't know anything. So Jesus tells us in Luke 21, 12 through 19, Jesus says, but before all these, speaking of the end time, those things that will happen, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons and being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Jesus is saying, this is going to happen to you. If Jesus says it's going to happen, it's going to happen to all the followers or a good percentage of the followers of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, and he says, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. And so he says, they're going to, you, you have to be prepared for your testimony. Your testimony. Jesus says, sell it therefore in your heart. Sell it therefore in your heart, not to meditate before what you shall answer. In other words, don't prepare a script. Don't think that they're going to ask you questions that you're going to, it's going to be scripted. What Jesus says, if it's not already in you, then a script is not going to work for you. But then he says, for who? I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. So in other words, you have to study this. We have to study it in order for us to be, at that time, ready to give it back. Does that make sense? Because they're going to judge you here on earth, but God is going to be judging how you deal with the answers up in heaven. Amen? So if we have it in us, we will be prepared, and our enemies will not be able to gainsay anything against us, or not just gainsay, but also resist. It's one thing to gainsay, but another thing is to resist. In other words, when they hear us, their hearts shall be melted as butter. Amen? Amen. But then here's another warning. And you shall be betrayed. This is pretty, this is pretty sombering, as Jesus says it. He says, and ye shall be betrayed by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends and some of you shall they cause to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish, and your patience possess ye your souls. And so as we prepare for this time of, as we talked about in Sabbath school, this, small, this time of trouble, and we know we've learned, we know that there's no such thing as a small little time of trouble, but it is a time of trouble that progressively gets more and more intense until we build up, until the world builds up to the time of great trouble, which is Daniel 12 and 1. Does that make sense? So we're in a troublous time, but it's going to keep mounting and mounting and getting more and more ten ten tenuous to the time to, to it builds up to the time of trouble. But Peter comforts us. Peter gives us a comfort as how we are to be when that time comes. 1 Peter 3, 12 through 17. 1 Peter 3, 12 through 17. Peter gives us comfort, but if we're not in the Lord, it's going to be hard for us to get into the Lord when that time happens. Peter says, for the eyes, 1 Peter 3, 12 through 17, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he? that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good. So Peter is letting us know that if we're doing good, then we have nothing to worry about. 
There's nothing to worry about if you're doing good. You may well be persecuted for doing good, but God says there's nothing to worry about for, being, for doing good. He continues, Peter continues and says, but, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so there are going to be those who will call themselves doing the Lord's work, but they will also be twisting the Lord's work. And as a result, they will find themselves in trouble. But that is not to be for God's true people. God's true people will suffer for doing good, and happy are we to be for suffering for doing good. For that is what happened to Peter and Paul and all the disciples. They didn't suffer for doing evil. They suffered for doing good. And, and righteous are we. Righteous will we have been for doing good. Verse 16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evil doers, did they speak evil of Daniel? They tried their very best, but they couldn't speak evil of him except for his association with his God. In other words, they speak, spoke, spoke evil of him for doing good and said, we're going to use good against him. Woo. They may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well doing than for evil doing. Paul warns us to prepare to do good and be punished for it, but never resort to doing evil, because to resort to do evil in the Lord's eye, we will be punished for doing evil. So no matter what comes upon us, we have to continually do good. Now, as evil comes, and evil's going to come your way, anybody think evil's not going to come your way? Evil's going to come everyone's way. If you are doing good, evil is going to come your way. It may come your way, but it will have no effect on you because Dan David tells us in Psalms 119, Psalms 119 and verse 11, Psalms 19, 1 and 11, I mean, Psalms 119, 11, thy word have I that I so if the word is in us, then we will not sin. We will not sin. So God's expectation is his people it his people is to hide his word in our hearts and so as we are now in this time of judgment as we are now in this time of judgment we are to be looking at what are those things about us that if Christ were standing right beside us right beside us no matter where we are okay no matter where we are I, we used to, when, when we were children, we really used to say, parents, it's 11 o'clock, do you know where your children are? Well, they don't say that anymore, right? <laughs> I was always taught that because my last name was Burns, I had to live such a way that if my mother or my father would, were with me, whatever I did could gain their approval. The standard is even higher now because Christ is standing right near us. Amen. And no matter what we're doing, it always has to pass the judgment. Judgment is not always out there. Judgment is right there. Jesus is standing right beside us. And so what God was trying to let Daniel understand, or get Daniel, but not just Daniel. He was trying to get those who would read the book of Daniel to understand that judgment is right up on you. And so when we looked at this judgment and we talked about these ten, these ten hordes or ten divisions of Rome and how God used that in the judgment, remember as, as we talked about it, going back to Daniel 7, going back to Daniel 7, you and I will participate in the judgment if we, are, if we hold on and hold fast till he comes, we will judge angels, Satan, and other human beings. Do we know that? And so God is telling Daniel in Daniel 7, 18 through 24, and he's telling us, especially us, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom how long? Forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. God wants Daniel to know that although you see all these wicked things that this beast is doing, this beast is subject to a judgment. 
This beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured breaking pieces and stamped the residue or the remnant with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, and I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. How long did this beast prevail against the saints? The Bible tells us in verse 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. In this one verse, verse 22, we see from the time 1798, 18, 1844, until the end of time. We see all the things that will have an effect on this dreadful beast. And verse 23 says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And then, excuse me, and the ten horns out of his, this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. This is the career of the Roman system, also to include the papacy. And as we look at the trumpets and the woes, as we have looked at the trumpets and the woes, where did we finish? Do you remember where we finished? Does anyone remember where we finished? I do. <laughs> Turn with me, if you will. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation 8, our opening text. Revelation 8. How many trumpets are there? Seven. 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 All right, all right. How many kingdoms were there? Four, Four kingdoms. But how about in this example, how many toes? Should I say how many toes? Ten. Ten. Okay, all right. Because remember, those toes are also used in, they use in, interjected with kingdoms. There were 10 kingdoms and three plucked them up. Three were plucked up, correct? Yes. Correct? Yes. I want to be sure now. Now, let's go ahead to our opening text, Revelation 8, 2 and 6. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And trumpets are representation of what? War. Memorial and war. So in this particular instance, these trumpets are getting ready to announce war on... All right, let's get this right. Seven trumpets. Revelation 8. Who is the entity that's getting ready to have judgment executed on it? Okay, that's why we're here today. Let's continue. Seven trumpets. We're going we're gonna to find out in just a moment. Okay? Verse 6. Revelation 8 and 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. I heard someone say part of it. Turn with me if you, look with me if you will in verse 7. We've already covered verse 7, okay? But this is for review. And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail, and, and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Who is this application to? Rome, thank you, Sister Cammie. It is the Roman Empire. It is the pagan Roman Empire. Brothers and sisters, take notes, please. This is how William Miller and Josiah Lynch were able to understand and interpret and prophesy August 11, 1840. They understood the seven trumpets. And when it got to the fifth and sixth trumpets, they were able to use prophetic interpretation a day for a year to determine the 150 days and the 391 days and 15 minutes. They understood it because they understood Revelation 8. And so, and so days, 391 days. Thank you, Sister Burns. Jay and Andrew says this, speaking of this time, and again, when the seven angels received the seven trumpets, that's Revelation 8.2 and Revelation 8.6, when the seven angels received the seven trumpets, the scene of vision is still the first apartment, okay? The first apartment of the sanctuary, all right? Now, that makes sense. 
So when those first one through six start blowing, it's sometime before the year 1844, right? So there's been some kind of a judgment executed on the Roman Empire, but then in 1844, judgment now goes to the rest of the world. The rest of the world. God uses, God uses his people to tell his people, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come, and that is in 1844. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right, I want to be sure of that. And so when we look at the first four trumpets, the first four trumpets, they were, as we saw before, they, question, Sister Darling? No. Okay, they were to be used, they were used to destroy the Western Roman Empire. The pagan or Western pagan Roman, however you want to coin it, is the pagan Roman Empire. The first four. Then you have the second two, which are used to destroy the Eastern Roman Empire. Does that make sense? All right, so once those two trumpets will have done their work, once those two trumpets will have done their work, and we will go through that, then you have the seventh trumpet. That is the final trumpet. There are only seven trumpets. Which trumpet are we in right now? Seven. Seventh trumpet. So that means we're running out of time. We're on borrowed time. Amen? Amen. So when we, saw, when we see this seventh trumpet, this seventh trumpet is not for the west, it's not for the east, it's for the west, east, north, south. It's for the entire world. That's why the first angel we are told, and I saw another angel flying in the mist of heaven. That means that is a worldwide message. We are the people of the seventh trumpet. From a spiritual standpoint, God uses us to tell the people about him, and God, from a physical standpoint, God uses Islam to destroy the world. The first, Trump, the first world, the second world were Islam, or the Arabs. And the third world is a worldwide attack of the Arabs on the world. And we'll talk about that when we get to five and six. And so once that's done, once we do our work, that's it. But that means that God is waiting for us to do our work. Doesn't that mean that? So when we look at the seven trumpets, the, all seven trumpets, the first six are judgment of the pagan Roman Empire. Please write this down. Please review this in Revelation 8, and we'll go through Revelation 9 as well, but please, please understand this. Do everything you can understand this. Most of you have the books. In this church, most of you have Daniel the Revelation, Haskell. Don't you have those? Many of you have Jones, and many of you have... You, you, this church could teach a lot of people. The first four, do you want to know the first four? Uh -huh. yeah. I, the first four is the West. Now, I know it's kind of difficult. It's, it's kind of hard to grasp this sometimes because we live out here in the U.S., right? And, it's, and we live in the Midwest of the U.S., right? So when we, start, when, we have, when we have to travel from the U.S. to Europe, that's an eastward traveling, isn't it? It's, we have to fly to the east, right? And so when we get to Europe, it's like we're east of the United States, right? But when you're in Europe, it's divided by east, west, north, south as well. So when you look at the Roman Empire, it has an eastern front and it has a western front, correct? And so our minds, when we leave here, when we're studying, our minds need to move over to Europe and start thinking in terms of east, west, north, south there. And I would, I would also recommend get yourself an atlas. Get yourself a map to study this and understand these things. Get a map. There's not a, it's no surprise. How many people have a Bible in here that doesn't have a map in the back of it? All of us. Because God wants us to use the map to understand geography. Doesn't that, does that make sense? All right, so when we look at the first six trumpets, they are for the destruction of the Roman Empire. Amen, okay, we're okay. And then the final trumpet is the destruction of the world. Now this is a, we, we, so the first trumpet we already did, so I'm not gonna review it. The first trumpet we already did. And who was the first trumpet? The Goths. Somebody hit, did you get that? The Goths. G-O-T-H-S, the Goths. The, the, the Goths 
are divided into two groups, the West being the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths being the East. But the most of the damage that was done to the Roman Empire in this particular segment was the Visigoths, but all of them were part of the ten barbarian hordes that came down and destroyed the Roman Empire. We're only given four in Revelation 8, but all ten, all ten did some work on the Roman Empire, okay? Does that make sense? There are ten barbarian tribes, but only four are explained in Revelation 8. Are we okay with that? And again, you got Smith's books, Haskell's books, Jones' books, it's in there. You got Ritpath, it's in there. This is not made up. All right? Okay, so we, we, we took care of the Goths a couple of weeks ago. And we're going to have to fly through the next four, the next three. Okay? I know. <laughs> I know. Let's go to, let's go to the, second, the, second, tr the second trumpet. Let's go to the second trumpet. Okay? We're there with Revelation 8, 8 through 9. Revelation 8, 8 and 9. Tell me amen. You should have it. We're already in Revelation. Amen. The Bible says, and the second angel sounded. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. The vandals, excuse me, the vandals are a very interesting group because they were the only power, the only power of the barbarians that were a sea power. They were Moors, they, were from, they had something to do with the Moors, they had something to do with Carthage. And if you look here on this map, you'll see there's Rome, the circle is Rome. And then you look at the big circle, that's where the Vandals operated from, but that's not where the Vandals came from. The Vandals operated from there, and that right there would be called Little Constantine. It was a town called Little Constantine off the northern coast of Africa. At one time it was called Tunisia, well, excuse me, at one time it was called Carthage, then it became Tunisia, and now it's Libya. It's the same place. And those people were well known. Okay, Tunisia and Libya sit side by side. Let me correct myself. And those people were well known for understanding how to navigate water. water. And that term vandal, you know where that, you know where the word vandalism comes from? from those people because they were rough. They could handle themselves. Okay, so when we look at these, these people called the Vandals, they were barbarian tribes or they were called Germanic. They were from Germany or what is now called Germany. It wasn't Germany at the time, all right? So they came from Germany. You see them right there and there's Germany and there's how they operated. That's how they, they went through. They went through the, what's now the, what's the Atlantic Ocean into the Mediterranean, came down there to what's, what's now Tunisia and then they came up up to Rome, up to Rome. Interesting. They were the only ones that were a seafaring or, or a mooring uh, country. And in source book for Bible students, we see the following. The reason why we need to understand these things is when we get to verse, when we get to Revelation 9 and go to the fifth and sixth trumpets, we need to know what makes you, 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 Seventh day Adventist the most important people on the earth today. Amen. Now you may say, wait a minute, that's a tall order, Brother Burns. You may say, that is a tall order. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is this, no one in the world could understand and could explain the Eastern question. Right. No one could understand it and no one could explain it until Josiah Litch and William Miller gave the interpretation and said on August 11th, 1840, the Ottoman Empire is going to come to its end. No one believed it. We sat in someone's home down in Canberra, Australia, who was from Europe. And I said, what would have happened in that time if someone made that kind of prediction? He said, everybody would have just stopped. Because they lived at a time where all of Europe was fearful of what are these crazy Ottomans going to do next. So when, the seven, when what became the Seventh-day Adventists started telling the world what is going to happen, they were like, now these men are really going out on the limb. But they had to go back and understand history from the beginning of the seven trumpets. That's why we're studying this now, so you can explain why you are a Seventh-day Adventist. And so we look here at the source book for Bible students. Source book for Bible students, it says, speaking of the Vandals, it says, thus a part of the, a part of the prefigurations of the second trumpet have been fulfilled. 
but its ships, speaking of the Vandals, and the insular provinces of Sicily and Sardinia still remained to the Western Empire, of the destruction of which the prophecy seemed to speak also. For it said, the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed, was too, was too fulfilled by Genseric, who was the leader. Mark what followed after the capture of Carthage. Carthage is right here. Oh, let me take you back to the slide to where Carthage is so you'll be able to see where Carthage is. Here is where Carthage was. Carthage is no longer a term, but Carthage was right here. Carthage was right here. Okay? The people were called Carthaginians, and their general was Hannibal. Anyone ever heard of Hannibal? He was a bad boy. <laughs> Hannibal was their general, and, and had it not been for the conquering of the Carthaginians, Rome would have never, ever conquered the Greeks. All right? Again, that's in writ paths. You can, you can actually find it in also The Two Republics, which is A.T. Jones's book. There are quite a few books. This isn't, I don't know anything that you don't have access to, okay? So let's go back to where we were. Did I miss anything? No, you didn't miss anything. Good. Okay. And then, we told here, and then the fleets of the van, the fleets, the vandal fleets that issued from the port of Carthage again claimed the empire of the Mediterranean. So they didn't just attack the Romans, they actually ended up having control of the Mediterranean Sea. So if they had control of the Mediterranean Sea, now the pagan Roman Empire was landlocked because of the barbarians in the south. Sicily was captured by them, and Sardinia, and the other Western Isles, all that was in the third part of the sea. Twice on occasion, in the same book, twice on occasion, alike memorial, memorable, the Roman navies, with vast preparations, were collected to destroy the Vandal power. They mounted an attack against the Vandals. But suddenly, and most disastrously, in the harbors of Carthagena and Bona, when the eyes of the Romans were fixed on them with hopes raised to the highest, they were utterly destroyed. What did God say was going to happen? God said it was going to happen, right? He said it was going to happen in around 90, 92 AD because that's when John the Revelator saw this vision, amen? So some 340 years later, it happened. God is trying to tell you, brothers and sisters, he's trying to tell us something that we got to grasp it. He's trying to say, I know what I'm going to do. I just need you to be prepared. That's all he wants. He says, he, he, it, we are told the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Right? But those things he revealed, he revealed to who? Us and our children, that for what? That we may do the words of his law. So when he reveals a secret to us that was a secret at one time, he's saying, I'm giving it to you so I will have credibility so that you will hold fast to my law, knowing that I am going to judge not only them, but I'm going to judge you as well. That's what God is trying to tell us in what happened to the Roman Empire. They were utterly destroyed, in the latter case, by fire ships driven among them in the obscurity of night so that the remainder of the prediction was fulfilled also. The fire of the Vandal volcano might not spend itself until not only what was habitable in the Western Sea was destroyed, but the third part of the empire. God said this was going to happen. This is a historian looking back at what did happen. The prophecy said what's going to happen. History said so in other words, the hand in the glove, the hand in the glove, it worked just as God said it would happen. And finally, we see that the Vandals were unique among the German nations by the fact that they maintained a fleet. None of the other barbarian tribes maintained a fleet. Does that make any sense to you? And so as we look at, Christian. yes, Christian. yes, um, do I go back? The Mm-hmm. Wonderful question. Sister, Sister Georgette said, explain the fire ships. The Moors trained the Vandals how to not only build ships,
but also how to use ships. The, obviously, the Vandals had some experience in, 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 in sailing a ship because they sailed from Germany all the way down there, right? But they sailed not, much, not as much as a warring group, but as just people who sailed. But then when they came in contact with, those, with the Moors, they learned how to use ships for war. Sometimes they used ships and they were on them. Sometimes they used ships and they put hay and pulp and pitch on them and they sailed and they sent those ships out to certain to go after other ships but there were no human beings on them. And they used those ships and they sent them in a direction and when their adversaries thought they were coming up on, some, uh, on a debilitated ship, that ship ended up crashing into them. And that's how the Romans were destroyed. Does that make sense? They were, that's why, they, that's why they, the Moors of Spain were so phenomenal because that name Moors, look up M-O-O-R, and you'll see that means someone who understands how to sail a ship very good, very well. All right? Are we okay, Sister Georgia? Yeah, but how did they, um, the ship, how did they... How did they get them out of sea? Yeah. Um, I haven't found anything that says how they got them out to sea. I just know that it was ships that were set ablaze into the harbors and sometimes, and it actually after ships that had men on them and were afloat. It, I don't know. That's a good question. That's a good question. Maybe I'll see it in further reading, but then we'll see what happens. And so that is the Vandals. And you see the time frame of the Vandals. So look at the, look at the dates. God would allow these various barbarian tribes to come in, destroy a part of the Roman Empire, set up camp, and then another part of the Roman, another group would come in, they would destroy that part of the Roman Empire, and set up that, those camps. Each one of these of these individual um, barbarian hordes ended up becoming one of the kings. Or the, for instance, the Anglo-Saxons, Great Britain, right? All right? The Lombardis, the Italians. All right? The Swovi, the Swiss. So each one of them, they attacked the Roman Empire and they set up camp wherever they were in the Roman Empire and they established themselves as a kingdom. The Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrog no, was it the Ostrogoths that were destroyed? Uh, no, the, 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 uh, the Huns, the, the Huns, the, Van, the Vandals, and the, uh, and the Harulis, those were the three that were plucked up. They were destroyed. We know nothing else about them except for what they did prior to that. Those were the three that the papacy plucked up. But So you look and you see a little gap of about 19 years, and the next group comes along, and that group was the Vandals. Okay, so we just talked about the Vandals. And then the next group that comes on the scene, yes, Well, you know what, I'll take my time because this is how we are to study. I would much rather take my time and we have to do it enough, do it next week, even though I have another plan for next week, but we'll just have to do what happens. We'll do it. <laughs> oh, you need that arm. Okay, go. So the vandals, they executed their, the judgment that the Lord allowed for them to execute on the Roman Empire from 429 to 468. A.D. Does that make okay? Thank you. you okay, Cammy? You Time's up. Uh -huh. okay. All right. Now, what's so unique about this is when we think about Nebuchadnezzar, and God told Nebuchadnezzar that when his heart is lifted up in him, he's going to be brought down, right? And God said that once you're brought down, it's going to be seven years. God knew exactly when Nebuchadnezzar was going to do it, but God says, I'm going to let's hold back. Maybe you might change your mind, but God knew. So what God is telling us, just like with the 1260 years, he knew when all these things were going to happen, but he does not control our will. So what he's saying here is, this could have taken longer or shorter, but I knew when it was going to happen. I knew that it was going to happen, and actually history tells us that it did happen. All right? Okay, now, are we finished? We ready? Okay, now we move on to verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. Are we there? We're there. And the third angel, so now the Huns are the third group of the barbarian hordes, right? These are the third group spoken of in Revelation 8. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. 
and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountain of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and the, men, and the many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, before we, we first want to say, wait a minute, Brother Burns, you said the vandals were the only ones who were seafaring. That's exactly right. But in, the, in this particular case, when it says waters, it's talking about people. Amen, amen. Huh? This is the third trumpet. This is the third trumpet. Uh, when it says third angel, it means, that sa it means the same as the third angel with a trumpet. So that's the third trumpet, all right? And so now we see it looks like this. So there was the... There are the vandals, and the next thing, now here's a unique thing, here's a unique thing. The Huns were actually not European, German. Not, not German. Think about the Huns, the Huns, the Huns. What nation you think about? Hungarian. Hungarian. They came out of this part right here. They came from over here. See some of the battles and things you're seeing happening in the world today? They're just old fights. It's Eastern Europe. This, this just, these are just old fights. And they're not, real, they're not your true European. The people that come out of this group are your Russians, Hung Ukrainian, Hungarian, all those come out of this group right here. You ever heard of the man called Attila the Hun? All right, everybody knows who that is. So the Huns come in, and they now attack Rome from its eastern front. Okay, so they, God is allowing them, he pulls his hand of protection back, and they're just bombarding, they're just bombarding the Roman Empire. This is not the Papal Roman Empire yet. This is the Roman, the pagan Roman Empire. We are told in History of the World by Ridpath, the third or synthetic division of the barbarian nations included besides the great race of the Huns, the Alawi, the Alans, the Averi, the Bulgarians, and the Hungarians. And also look at that, the Turks and the Tartars, which are the Russians. Of all the savage peoples, who beat along the borders of the Roman Empire and finally broke through and destroyed the civilization of the ancient world, the most ferocious were the Huns. And even though they're considered the most ferocious, when we get ferocious, when we get down to the Heruli, you'll be amazed to see how rough they were. That's, oh, I'm sorry, Sister Susan. That's in volume three of Rit Paths, volume three, page 1047. Okay? So the thing of it is, is we don't have to find, you're going to always find your people say, well, that's what you Seventh-day Adventists say. Right? They're going to say that's what you say. And you can say, well, wait a minute. Okay, here's a history book. Not written by Seventh-day Adventists. How do you gainsay against that? The Lord said, I'll give you a mouth and wisdom that your enemies will not be able to gainsay nor resist. And that's why he's given us more um, tools to use to be able to support our position. This gives us the basis so once we prove that the Western Empire was destroyed by just who God said was going to destroy it and we move over to the East, we don't have just some events, we have times of those events as well. So God gives us everything we possibly could use. Look, this shows a picture, this is a picture of the Huns coming into the Roman Empire. They were very, very vicious. We are told, again, in the source book for Bible students, speaking of the third trumpet or the third angel, Attila's invasion of the rivers about A.D. 450 in fulfillment of a treaty with Genseric, he, Attila, moved against the western provinces along the upper Danube, reached and crossed the Rhine at Basel, and thence tracing the same great frontier stream of the west, west down to Bel Belgium, made its valley one scene of desolation and woe. He was repulsed in the tremendous battle of Chalons. Did I pronounce that right, my French-speaking brethren? Chalon? Okay. And whither then, when thus forced to retrace his steps, he did direct them, whither but to fall on another destined scene of ravage, the European fountains of waters and the Alpine heights and the Alpine valleys of Italy. So he was, up in, he was up in the mountains where the water was flowing down. So I'm going to come after you another way. The meteoric or the speedy career of Attila, when in wrath, he was like an embodied volcano. History says his eyes becoming like points of fire. No one in all history has imbued millions of mankind with such an amount of terror as this hideous little Tartar. 
He was called Attila the Hun because he, when you consider what, how, how ferocious the Huns were, and he wasn't, they said he wasn't much more than four feet tall. Attila, leader of the Huns, had, had agreed with Genseric to attack the empire. So now, Genseric who, Genseric, who was the leader of the Vandals, and Attila, who was the leader of the Huns, decided, you take one part, and I'll take another part to attack the empire from the north and east while the vandals struck from the sea. This third trumpet of the prophecy designated the river regions as the scene of the bitter attack. It was just here in the region of the fountains of water that Attila directed his blows at the Roman Empire of the West. And that's in another book that you can find, Beacon Lights of Prophecy by W.A. Spicer. These are all proof positive, and we just want to move through this so we can get to vault to number five. So now when we look at the third trumpet, it is the Huns. Revelation 8, 10 through 11, from 451 to 453 AD. Notice how we're barreling down to that important year, 476 AD. Say it again. This is the third one. Did you get that? This is the third trumpet destroying all these God let loose to destroy the Western Roman Empire to prove that when, remember, Daniel saw this, he saw this entity, right? He saw the fourth bee, I mean, the, the fourth beast destroying the saints and trotting them down. And God said, look, there's a judgment. There's a judgment. All will be judged. And to give us a, a better capsized preview, he shows the judgment of the pagan Roman Empire so that we know that the judgment of, of papacy and the world is just as assured as the, as the Roman Empire was destroyed. That should let us know that when God says we're living in the hour of his judgment, we should be prepared. Amen? And so we look at the fourth and final, fourth and final group. The fourth and final group of the barbarians. And these are called the what? Heruli. Chapter 8 and verse 12. Chapter 8 and verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded. The fourth angel has the fourth trumpet. And the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Now this is interesting the way prophecy explains, or prophecy tells us this was going to happen. First, let's look at where the Heruli came from. They were, of course, another Germanic tribe. They come from up here, and they just basically come down and execute. They were the final ones to execute the judgment on the Roman Empire. Now we are told by A.T. Jones and Great Empires of Prophecy. That's what G.E.P. stands for, Great Empires of Prophecy. All these are also on your CD-ROM. A.T. Jones says, north of the Gepidae and extending into the southern provinces of Poland was the country of the Herula who fought what? Almost naked. Isn't it cold in that part of the world? Eastern part of Germany, also, right? Yeah, eastern part of Germany. They fought. They, uh, they said it again, Sister Georgette. Yeah, they, they were conditioned, but they, they fought almost naked. And whose bravery was like madness. But they say the Huns were even worse than the Harula. The, I'm sorry. Great empires of prophecy. All right? The Harula were a Vandalic tribe of ancient Germany. So they were related to the Vandals, but they weren't Vandals per, per se. The first historic mention of them is about the beginning of the third century. And the great movement of the Goths from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Do you hear any of those terms used today? The Baltic, the Black Sea. Yeah, we're just seeing things happening all over again. There's still, they're still foot being fought over. The Haruli and the Bulgarians are particularly mentioned. They fixed their habitation on the marshy lands near the Lake Neotoas, which is now known as the Sea of Azov. Anyone ever heard of the Sea of Azov? OK. I'm going to show you where the Sea of Azov is. See if I can. It won't. It might not. You might not be able to pull it up. Here's the Sea of Azov, right here. That's the Sea of Azov. What is this? What is this? We've talked about this enough times. I heard someone say it. Crimea. This is Crimea. Right here, right? 
Has this been in the news anytime in recent history? All right. And so how about the Sea of Azores? Anyone heard anything about them in the, in the news? The Sea of Azores, this is, this, is still, this is still the name of the sea. It's the Sea of Azov. And you had, a, you had a confrontation with the Russians and the Ukrainians right here in the Sea of Azov just last December. Just last December. So you see these things, this is just history, almost for lack of a better term, repeating itself all over again. As I continue, oh, so we, skip, we go on and talking about the Heruli, because this is the last one of the four. And onward those barbarians came, swiftly and in multitudes. For a hundred years the dark cloud had been hanging threateningly over the borders of the empire, encroaching slightly upon the west and breaking occasionally upon the east. But at the close of the fourth century, the tempest burst in all its fury, and the flood was flowing ruinously. And finally, in 476, when Odiasa, king of the Heruli, became the king of... Italy, the last vestige, the last vestige, the very end of the Western Empire of Rome was gone and was divided among the ten nations of barbarians of the north. That, that's how Rome was divided. God used those four hordes. He used all ten, but he tells us about four of them. But if you look historically, and in writ paths, you will find how all ten did what they had to do. God just, if he would have given us all ten, and look, if you think about it, some of these are just one verse. They're just one verse telling us what one group had done. But that the time frames of which they did it was long time frames, as I continue. But at, at the, okay, da, da, da. I think I finished that. The sun, now this explains, this explains how it worked. The sun shone as Rome as long as the counselor dignity in the kingdom was possessed of authority over other cities and provinces. So there was a group or a part of the government called the counselor. It represented one third of the government. The moon and the stars shone there as long as the ancient power of the Senate and the other magistrates remained. But these being taken away, which was done by this trumpet, what was there but darkness, and in a, in a universal failure of light, both diurnal, daytime, and nocturnal, nighttime. Namely, what belonged to the city to which a third part of the light of heaven was, was attributed. So the Roman Senate was destroyed, that was, that was one third. The counselor was destroyed, that was another third. And the emperor who was operating on that side, that was destroyed as well. So all three parts were destroyed by the remaining work of the Heruli. And, excuse me? That's, um, again, the source book for Bible students. Again, that's on your CD-ROM, page 507. Point one, paragraph one. Thank you, Sister Linda. Thank you, Sister Linda. So when we look at these four trumpets, having done they com their work, they absolutely destroyed the Western Roman Empire. They brought the Western Roman Empire to its knees. And so now we look and we see four of the seven trumpets having done their work. The fourth trumpet is the Herulis, also known as the Lombards the, and the Anglo-Saxon from 471 AD to 476 AD. I'm letting you write that down before I move on to the next one, Sister Linda. Thank you. All right. I'm ready to move, though. So when you look at this, while we're waiting, so when you look at each one of these, none of these, none of, they were all barbarians. All 10 of them were, were barbarians, barbarians. Three of them were considered Arians. Now, the Arians were completely at odds with the Roman Catholic system because the Roman Catholic system believed in the Trinity. So they plucked those three up, the Herules, the, the Vandals and the, it was the, actually the Ostrogoth, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoth, those three were plucked up, moved out of the way, and Rome basically took charge right then and there. And the Arian, they didn't believe in the Arian faith. You ready? We, we ready? Okay, no, All right. The Arians, they didn't believe in the Trinity. Right, the Arians, those three did not believe in the Trinity. The other three, they va the other seven vacillated back and forth, but eventually they were convinced that the papacy right. 
was right. So in summary, on this quick point, because I'm almost ready to wrap this up, the first four trumpets were, come on, who was the first one? The Goths. Second? Third? Fourth? Amen. Great. And so they worked to destroy the Western Roman Empire. And so we're going to move on. I'm not finished with them just yet, because I'm not going to do that. We won't be able to do the other two. We don't have enough time. Unless you want to eat until your lunchtime. Uh, somebody said no. Okay. <laughs> or afternoon. Maybe. The first four, the first four, speaking of the first four trumpets, this is again in your, in your source book for Bible students. Events of Western Rome's downfall summarized. Here's the summary. At this point in writing, says Barnes, that's who we're going to be quoting from, I looked on a chart, watch this, in history composed with no reference to this prophecy. So in other words, this is going to be secular in terms of how, who, who, was right, who, had, who he was looking at and found a singular and unexpected prominence given to four such events extending from the first invasion of the Goths and Vandals at the beginning of the fifth century to the fall of the Western Empire. He said, I'm seeing something, something consistent here. He says the first was the invasion of Alaric, king of the Goths, AD 410. A second was the invasion of Attila, king of the Huns, also known as the scourge of God or the hammer of God. A third was the sack of Rome by Genseric, king of the Vandals. The fourth, resulting in the fourth conquest of Rome, was that of Odiasa, king of the Heruli, who assumed the title king of Italy. We're consistent so far. Then he says, we shall see, however. Yes. <laughs> the previous one? No, this was the previous one. All right. Okay? We okay with this one, Suli? Yeah. All right. We shall see, however, on closer examination, that although two of these, Attila and Genseric, Huns and Vantals, were doing a part of their career, contemporary, they worked together, yet the most prominent place, or the person who did what it seemed, appeared to be the most work was, well, who? Genseric, right? And the events that attended the downfall of the empire, and that the second trumpet probably related to him, the third to Attila. These were, beyond doubt, four great periods or events attending the fall of the Roman Empire. He's saying a secular writer is confirming what the Bible says. But Rome, did you get that? He uses those who don't know him to go after the other ones who don't know him. He doesn't need, he doesn't need his people to fight his battles. He's done with that. Are we ready? All right, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done because I got four slides to do and that's gonna be it for this, for this morning. But Roman history did not end with the division. Daniel watched, remember now Daniel's allowed to see this, and behold, three came up among them another little horn, before which there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. A new power, a power outside the empire is here represented by the little horn. The three divisions which were plucked up were the Heruli in 493, the Vandals in 434, and the Ostrogoths in 538. Justinian, the emperor, the emperor whose seat was at Constantinople out east, working through the general Belisarius, was the power which overthrew the three kingdoms represented by the three horns, and the reason for their overthrow was their adherence to Arianism in opposition to the Orthodox Catholic faith. <laughs> the details of the overthrow and the religious controversy, which was the root of the trouble, are fully given in Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But Mushim in his history, by, by Mushim and in his church history and by others. And so as we look at wrapping this up, we see that the pagan Roman Empire in the West, here's a compass, east, west, north, south, the pagan Roman Empire in the West was destroyed by the barbarians. By the barbarians. And so that only leaves the eastern portion. Rome was now broken up into fat fragments, and the ten divisions pr presented to the prophet Daniel were each given power. As iron and miry clay refused to unite, 
So the fragments of the Western Roman Empire will remain separate until when? The end of time. So when you hear people saying this one world order, that's not what the Bible tells us. Within the year 476, which marks the fall of Rome, begins the history of the Middle Ages. Within the next few years, every obstacle was cleared away, and the papacy had a clear road to the throne. Nothing was, the troublemakers were out of the way. Odiesa was by faith an Arian, and his kingdom, that of the Heruli, was the first of the horns, according to Daniel 7, 8, to be plucked up by the little horn, which exalted itself and spake, spoke great words against the Most High. That's from where? Come on, where else? What's, what does it say? Which book? Story of the Seer of Patmos. Wonderful, wonderful. And yes, uh, page 159, 159, Par paragraph two. So in, in, in conclusion, in conclusion, God says no matter what you see, no matter how bad this thing looks, he's saying, I have got this. All you have to do, as we talked about this morning in Sabbath lesson, is our work inside. It's what we have to do on, on our behalf. Because God is telling us, regardless of what you do, there will be a judgment. And regardless of what the papacy or the pagan Roman Empire had done, God still judged. And he said, I'm going to judge you as well. Where will we all find ourselves in the judgment? Will we be in the balance, finding ourselves wanting? We don't want to be there. God is saying it's going to happen, brothers and sisters, in every single event that we see happening right in front of our eyes. Next week, well, this afternoon we may, if we have time, we may talk about finishing this up because next week I want to talk about what's going on with the evangelicals because we just don't have time today. But I really want to go deep into that because we have been talking about it on Wednesday night, Wednesday night prayer. We've been talking about it, but I think that now we need to understand. I'll give you a quick snapshot, a very quick snapshot. Very, very quick snapshot before we close this out. In Revelation 16, we see, Revelation 16 and, tw and 12, we see um, three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, right? Well, who's the dragon? Any question about that? Right. How about who's the beast? The papacy is the beast. And who's the false prophet? Apostate Protestantism. Amen? Do, do you need anyone to tell you who the dragon is? Okay. So we got that up. That's covered, right? Does the Lord need, or excuse me, is the Lord using the Seventh-day Adventist church to reveal who the beast is? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not the organization. The media is doing it for us. All the things that, all the things the papacy is doing, it's not a Seventh-day Adventist publishing a newspaper to tell the world that they're doing it. The world knows that they are wicked and that they are doing things to children. Amen? Am I, you, you okay with that, right? How about the evangelicals? Are we revealing to the world what the evangelicals are doing? Who's revealing to the world what the evangelicals are doing? The media. So guess what, brothers and sisters? We don't have to do anything to tell the world what they're doing, but we better know who they are. Because if we don't know who, we, who they are, like Sister, where did Sister Brenda go? Sister Brenda said, in order, in order for us to be prepared, we must know our judgment, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, our judgment is not the mark of the beast, it's the image to the beast. If you don't know who the image to the beast is, you're going to join your hands right, right with them. And it's going to be too late. We finally, as we close, our opening line of scripture, our opening line of scripture told us that Revelation 8, 2, and 6 says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Six have sounded and done their work. Six trumpets have sounded and they have done their work. Amen. What about the seventh trumpet? What about you? How do you and I stand with the seven trumpets? Are we giving that trumpet a certain sound? Or are we sitting on our testimony? Because John saw in Revelation 10, 
He says, and I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a, cloth, with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voice. This is the work of the three angels. This is the work that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is responsible for. God says, I did that work with people who don't even know me and destroying the Roman Empire. I need you to tell the world that a judgment is now in place. We need to know and live these messages. We need to live them in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own church. You can go out there all you want, but if people don't see it in you, we're false prophets as well. So brothers and sisters, our commitment needs to be that we are going to understand where we are and live like we know where we are because many of us don't take this, don't take the, what's being shared up here in the pulpit, take it home and let it sit on your desk or wherever until next week. Study it. Let his word be hidden in your heart that we might not sin against him, that others may see truly Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us close out in the word of prayer. Now, Father, which art in heaven, what more can we ask of you? You've given us everything that we need, and in even more, what can be done for your people that you have not already done? You've given us your word. You've given us a church, not physical, but spiritual. You sent Christ. You sent your prophets before times in the morning, in the morning of the history of this world. Everything we need, we have. And at the same time, the enemy is amassing his troops against us. Lord, we are without excuse. And so we ask that you will help us to understand ourselves as individuals. We cannot be looking outside of us and knowing that the judgment is a judgment against ourselves. Help us to understand the times we are in. Help us to know where we are as individuals as Christ is knocking on the doors of our heart. We are in the Laodicean in time, the church judging. Lord, please let us not be found lukewarm. Let us be on fire for your word, Lord. And we'll be careful to give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory that you so richly deserve. So we ask these blessings and all others in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.